Hello. So we continue our study of the regularity of weak solutions to elliptic PDEs in divergence form. So in particular for today, we're going to show that under some continuity assumptions on the leading coefficients of the equation, then we can, uh, uh, the, then we can say that u is Hilder continuous um, in the interior. So for today, we're sort of going to roughly divide our presentation to three parts. So the first one, we will be talking about uh, like the general plan to, uh, to prove the result that we have for tonight. Um, the second one would focus more on the estimates. And I kind of want to single them out because the techniques that we're going to see in obtaining these estimates, um, you actually see it in other places too. So more or less, they're pretty standard and um, it is worthwhile to learn how to do them. And the last one is finishing up the proof. And we're also going to demonstrate how sometimes you need some kind of a bootstrap argument. So what that roughly means is you sort of get something at one iteration, but it's not exactly what you want. So you repeat the argument again. And at each repetition, you get closer and closer to the thing that you need to prove. Uh -huh. And this sort of thing appears not just in this proof, but in other places as well. Uh -huh. So roughly, uh, that's going to be like the plan for tonight. Okay, so let's begin. So uh, so again, a recall, I'm taking this from uh, Han and Lin's book. And what they say is that the general idea here is that we freeze uh, the leading coefficients of our equation. So by that, we mean uh, the matrix A. Uh -huh. And then we compare solutions with A harmonic functions. And what A harmonic means is these are functions W such that divergence of like A grad W is equal to zero. Okay. Now Han and Lin says in their book, uh, say in their book that the regularity of solution depends on how close they are to a harmonic functions. So in particular, we're going to be looking at uh, functions of the form of v equals u minus w, where w is going to be some function, uh, uh, some a harmonic function, and u is the solution to our PDE in the interior. So we're gonna uh, look at estimates for V or sort of work with this. Okay, so that's the general idea. And it's kind of looks simple. And I uh, actually, when I first started this, I thought it was simple, but when I was doing the details, uh, it's actually very technical. And it's good in a way because it demonstrates uh, a lot of techniques uh, that um, you can use or you will see uh, when you study um, similar proofs. So I think it's worthwhile to learn. Okay. So let's begin. Uh -huh. So uh, we have some assumptions in A and these are fairly standard. We assume that A here is uniformly elliptic. And what that means is A satisfies uh, this matrix inequality, and we talked about what this means uh, from last time. And here, small lambda and big lambda are positive. And because of this assumption, this actually implies that A is going to be in L infinity. So I just kind of want to um, uh, rectify something that I said from last time. I said uh, that this side of the inequality gives us that A is in L infinity, but I think it, this also contributes to it. Excuse me, but anyway, A is in L infinity and A is uniformly elliptic. Now, later on, uh, for our result, we are going to use, uh, we are going to need that A is um, continuous in the closure of B1. And note that the closure here, B1, is going to be the unit ball centered at zero of radius one. Mm -hmm. Now, the closure of B1, this is compact. So this is going to be compact, so that means that A is going to be uniformly continuous. And what that means, so I have here some little graph here, what that means is that this is a very rough way of putting it. Um, intervals of, let's say, length delta gets mapped to intervals of, let's say, length epsilon, regardless of where you are in the set. So you can sort of move this here, it still gets mapped to something of length at most epsilon. And note that not all continuous functions um, has this property. Okay. So, uh, 
we proceed. Uh -huh. So we assume that u is in h1 of uh, b1, h1 here is the solvable space w12, and that it solves the following um, uh, equation. So we have integral over b1 of a grad u that grad phi plus cu phi is equal to integral of f phi uh, over b1 for every phi in h10. Uh, and what this means is, remember, functions in H10 are functions in H1 such that their trace um, is equal to zero on the boundary. Uh -huh. And note that this is not actually how you define uh, H10. There's a different definition, which I think we mentioned in the preliminary video. But in the case where the boundary is nice and all, then uh, this is an equivalent characterization of functions in H10. Okay, so it kind of looks like abstract and all, but uh, what this means is that roughly speaking, U solves the following PDE in the interior. Okay, so let's make sense out of this. It solves this PDE that uh, that is somewhat sort of clear uh, based on what we see here, doing integration by parts. We see why solving this solves this in a weak sense. And I'm saying here in the interior, note that we, uh, we started talking about like um, u solves a PDE in some domain omega. Here we have b1. So the um, essence here is if you know what happens uh, for u when u solves this equation in b1, more or less you sort of know uh, the behavior of u if it solves the equation in some other ball. Uh -huh. And remember, we started talking about that these are going to be interior estimates. So interior in the sense that we sort of look at what U does or what U is at some ball contained in the domain. Okay, so this is, uh, this is why I for, sort of say that roughly U here solves the, the PDE in the interior. Uh -huh. So by uh, knowing what, it, uh, what, what the behavior is in balls, uh, or in B1 even, you know what the behavior is in like uh, arbitrary balls so that if you want to talk about interior behavior, you th what that means is you look at balls contained in the domain and then ask like, what is you doing there? Or what is you, uh, what is you in there? Okay. So the goal uh -huh, is to show that U is C alpha. And this is a step up because subordinate functions uh, can be uh, discontinuous. Uh -huh. There are certain instances where Sobolev functions are actually continuous. Uh, it's by uh, a Sobolev embedding, which we might um, discuss at some point. Uh -huh. But I think in our case, it's not necessarily that. And uh, so this is some kind of a, an, an improvement. Okay. Okay, and uh, note that Hilder continuous functions aren't uh, necessarily very nice because, for example, the virus stress function, which is nowhere differentiable, that is Hilder continuous. So it's nice because it's continuous and that you can uh, sort of quantify the continuity, but not kind of nice uh, per se. We need something stronger. Okay. Okay, uh -huh. so our main result is this one. Uh -huh. So let u be in H1 and let that solve the equation that we have previously. We assume that the coefficients are continuous and that we have the following. So C here, it's in Ln. And note that this is different from the uh, integrability assumption that we have in the previous video, where we said that the minimum condition is that it's in L. N over two. Mm -hmm. So we need, uh, we sort of needed to strengthen that. Is it strengthen? Um, let me. Uh, yes, uh, because sorry, <laughs> there was a bit of lag time there. L n. Uh, so n is bigger than n over two. So yeah, uh, I, I kind of doubted myself there. So yes, L n is contained in ln over 2, so the, it's a stronger condition. Uh -huh. And the reason that we need this stronger condition is, uh, we'll see later on, we sort of need to pay a bit of uh, something fr uh, from C so that we get what we want. Okay, so this is fine, uh -huh. this is fine. Uh, the next assumption is F is in LQ. For some Q in this interval n over 2 to n, it kind of looks, looks something, uh, 
out of like nowhere but we're gonna explain later on because we uh recall that the minimum assumption that we need for uh for f is that it's in l of 2n over m plus 2 so it's i don't know at least to me it's not uh obvious at first glance why if q is in this interval why would it follow that f is in l of 2n over m plus 2 uh -huh. so this involves just a bit of calculation which we are going to demonstrate in the proof okay so with these assumptions, so continuity assumptions, stronger integrability conditions on uh, C and F, then we uh, can say that U is Hilder continuous. Uh -huh. Where the um, uh, alpha here is going to be equal to 2 minus N over Q, and this is in 0, 1. And one can show fairly easily that with the assumptions that we impose on Q, then alpha is indeed in this interval. Okay. Okay. So, moreover, uh, we can say something more. Uh, we can uh, have a quantitative result. So, there exists some R0 dependent on data such that for any uh, x in this uh, smaller ball and any r smaller than this R0, the following holds here. So, we have a gradient estimate. So, the L2 norm of the gradient in this ball is controlled by, um, this is data, we have the H1 norm in the bigger ball, uh -huh. and we have here uh, this uh, factor of R, and this is actually important, we're going to talk about it later. Uh, on the next slide, so we have here this gradient estimate, uh -huh. so we have a bunch of constants uh, times a factor of like R raised to N minus 2 plus 2 alpha. Mm -hmm. Now, the constant here depends on the ellipticity constant on C, and tau here is, uh, can be interpreted as some kind of a modulus of, modulus of continuity for A. So what that means is um, uh, this thing uh -huh, is controlled by tau of this. So this sort of, sub, some kind of pseudo quantifies uh, uh, the continuity uh, of a. Uh -huh. So this is a function that goes to zero as its argument goes to zero. Okay. Okay, so um, that was uh, quite a lot. So just a recap, you have assumptions, it gives you Hilder continuity, okay? And inside, inside B1, you can say something a bit more in the sense that you have something quantitative. And what that means is you have this gradient estimate on, uh, on U, in particular L2 norm of the gradient in this ball is controlled by a bunch of constants times R raised to this power, okay? Where this particular constant depends on ellipticity constant, on C and the modulus of continuity. A modulus of continuity sort of describes how A is continuous. Okay, okay. Now, um, why does that give us like a uh, Hilder uh, regularity? At least like, what is the significance of the gradient estimate? So um, we actually have proven something from the last video. Uh -huh. It's an easy consequence of the Poincaré uh, inequality in the uh, big theorem that we proven last time. Excuse me. Okay. So let's, let's look at it here again. Uh -huh. So by the Poincaré inequality, note that if you satisfy the above gradient estimate, okay, so let's see. So what we have here in the first line is just the Poincaré inequality. The L2 norm of this uh, difference, uh, so it's the deviation of u from its average. Uh -huh. This is controlled by some constant dependent only on the dimension times the radius of the ball squared, L2 norm of the gradient. So this is Poincaré inequality. Now, the previous uh, theorem gives us a control on this term, uh -huh, which I uh, sort of colored red. Uh -huh. And this is controlled by a constant times this, uh, uh, this R term, R raised to this particular thing. So multiplying that to R squared, we get this one. So we have 
uh, a growth condition on integrals and this is uh, this was the point of the last video uh, information on the growth of these integrals gives you um, Hilder continuity so if you have that this is controlled by some constant times r raised to this particular power then uh, you have that it's gonna be um, in uh, Hilder continuous and you have this estimate on the Hilder norm okay okay so uh, recap gradient estimate of the theorem together with Poincaré inequality gives us this growth condition on the integral and by the result that we have previously we have we conclude that u is Hilder continuous and that we have this quantitative estimate meaning to say we have this control on the uh, Hilder norm okay okay so that is what the theorem is saying so let's sort of look at some kind of uh, heuristic as to what's gonna happen okay so let's see if I can write this nicely so this is all very rough this is in to be interpreted in a weak sense uh-huh but the idea is sort of uh, something like this in the weak sense uh-huh you have that um, divergence of a of x grad u plus c u is equal to f mm -hmm. so the idea is note that uh, in the previous video we were saying that we are gonna prove regularity using two things uh, via two routes I'm not sure I'm never sure how to pronounce that word uh -huh. routes roots I don't know um, where one of them is called like a perturbation it's it's a perturbation method and the other one is like an iteration method so we're focusing on the perturbation part uh-huh and it's called perturbation because of this uh-huh so we are going to freeze the uh, coefficient a mm -hmm. so for some fix x0 so we are going to write this as a of x minus a of x0 plus a of x0 so that I can write uh, this equation as divergence of a of x0 grad u is equal to f minus cu minus divergence of or let's make it plus plus divergence of a of x0 minus a of x grad u uh -huh. and if uh, this here is sort of controlled by the modulus of continuity uh, evaluated at the distance between x and x0. So what I want to say is that if this, uh, if x and x0 are close to each other, then I can sort of control uh, this term here, more or less. So we're going to see in the proof. Okay, so we have that. So that's one part. We're freezing co the coefficient. Uh -huh and then estimating the leftover part. Now the other key part in the argument is we consider a function, a function that solves this equation, so divergence of a of x0, grad w is equal to zero, plus some boundary condition, we're gonna see that later on. And what we're gonna do is we are going to subtract this equation from this equation giving us something like uh, let's see if I have space it gives us something like divergence of a of x0 um, grad of uh, u minus w is equal to f minus cu plus divergence of a of x0 minus a of x uh, grad u okay so uh, note that um, w here is an a harmonic function uh -huh. so uh, also it's a solution to a constant coefficient equation so here uh, this is a constant matrix because x0 is fixed okay and doing the subtraction of this from this we arrive with this equation here so we already talked about this one uh, we can sort of make an estimate for this one 
uh, and it depends on how close x is to x0 and stuff like that. And from other preliminary things that we are actually going to use uh, in, in our proof, we can also say something about this term. So maybe that's really the idea behind this. Uh -huh. You sort of uh, perturb from, a, from x0 and then sort of manage what's left uh -huh, and then sort of look at uh, how or how would you estimate um, uh, this difference here between our solution u and a harmonic function w. Okay, so uh, the idea sort of looks simple, but um, like what they say, the devil is in the details. So the proof for today is going to be a bit technical. So uh, please bear with me. Okay. Okay, so okay, so we talked about what we want to do for today. Uh, we've talked about what the gen uh, what the result is, uh -huh, what and what the general plan is. Okay. So now we look at the first steps of the proof and then that's gonna be the end of part one. So let's see, let me just look up my notes. Okay. So let's start proving this thing. Okay, so we let um br of x0 be some ball containing b1. Mm -hmm. So note that for a test function phi in br of x0, ah oh, sorry, in h10 of br, excuse me, sorry, of x0, ah uh, no, I keep messing up, I'm sorry, h10 of b1, okay, so we know that u solves the following equation. So I have a grad, or let me write it as a of x, a of x grad u dot grad c plus c u phi is equal to integral f phi integrals over b1. Mm -hmm. And similar to our dis uh, heuristic discussion from before, I am going to write this as a of x minus a of x zero plus a of x0. So I'm just adding and subtracting a constant matrix. Okay, so we can rewrite this then as uh, the integral over b1 of a of x0 grad u dot grad phi is equal to integral over b1 of f phi uh, minus uh, cu phi plus I have here uh, a of x0 minus a of x grad u dot grad phi. So what happened here, um, I just moved this term into this side and this term to that side. Okay, so it's just a rewriting. Okay, so we have this one, which sort of looks familiar. This is like the first step in the heuristic part of our uh, discussion. So what we do next is we consider the following problem. Okay, so we consider uh, the problem divergence of uh, a of x zero grad w sorry is equal to zero uh, in b r of x zero so in uh, in the smaller box. And remember from uh, our heuristic discussion before, we were saying that, okay, we consider an, uh, a, an, an a harmonic function plus a boundary condition. So the boundary condition that we are going to use is w is equal to u uh, on the boundary, okay? So we consider this problem, and in fact, we consider the weak form of this problem. So the weak form now here is, uh, we find some w uh, in h1 of uh, b r x0 such that we have that uh, u minus w is in h1 0 of uh, b r of x0 and this is just uh, like the boundary condition being satisfied in a weak sense okay and the other is that we have uh, the integral over br of x0 
a of x zero grad w the grad v um, is equal to zero for every phi in h one zero for every test function. Okay. Okay. So uh, we consider weak solutions to this. Uh, boundary value problem and what that means is we're looking for some function w in h1 of this ball such that u minus w is in h1 0 and what that means is that uh, the trace of u minus w is 0 meaning to say the trace is a linear operator so that the trace of the u is the same as the trace of w and that is a weak form of saying that w is equal to u on the boundary okay and we want that this is satisfied. So this just came from this one using integration break parts. Okay. So uh, we're not going to prove it. Or we sort of have proven some kind of a variant of this uh, in the preliminary video. But it's not difficult to show that there exists a unique W in H1 of BR of X0 that solves... The above problem. I'm not sure if that's proper English. Okay. Uh, note that um, I'm also planning on doing a series on existence methods for elliptic PDEs. So we are gonna talk about like how do you show that weak solutions exist for like um, elliptic PDEs. Okay. But for now, um, yes, this is guaranteed that there is indeed a a unique. Uh, weak solution W that solves this particular problem. Okay, okay. So what I'm gonna do is, so I'm good. I have this, uh huh, and I have this equation. So remember when we were doing the heuristic part of our discussion, we have two equations. You subtract one from the other. So we are gonna do the same thing here, uh huh. So. Oh, before I do that, uh -huh. note that this is an integral over BR of x0. The other one is an integral over B1. Okay, so let's just write it down. So we have phi in H1, 0 of BR of x0. And this is hand wavy, but we're sort of saying that you extend phi to 0 outside the ball. And it's still going to be, um, you can use it as a test function in the equation for u because it's in h1 of h10 of b1. So that is fine. So if I use this as a test function in the equation for u, what I'll get is, uh, instead of it being an integral over b1, it's now an integral over the smaller ball. So remember that this is contained in b1. And that outside this ball, uh, phi is zero. Okay. So I have now. What do we have? A of x zero grad u dot uh, grad phi is equal to integral over b r x zero, f phi minus um, c u phi plus a of x zero minus a of x. Um, grad u dot grad phi. Let's take the other equation, integral over b or x0, a x0 grad w dot grad uh, phi is equal to 0. So what we do is we subtract this equation from this one, and what that gives us is integral over b or x0 of a of x0 grad of u minus w dot grad phi is equal to this thing. So I'm just going to copy it. Okay, we're going to use technology. Copy and, oops, a bit too big. Paste. Okay, so we have the following thing, which is true for every phi in h10 of uh, br of x0. Okay, so we've just sort of um, formalized the, the heuristic arguments that we excuse me, mentioned before, okay? And this is true for every test function phi in H1, 0, okay? So now what I'm going to do is standard in, in uh, like obtaining estimates 
in the study of PDEs, okay? So, let's see, let's demonstrate that. So, I'm going to call U minus W, we're going to call this V, okay? Now, what do we know about V? Um, remember that when W came from some kind of problem, a boundary value problem, uh -huh. it's equal to U on the boundary. So, and what that means in the weak sense is that uh, U minus W, which is V, is in H1 zero of uh, BR of X zero. So it can be used as a test function because remember uh, the test function, the space of test functions in the previous equation, it's exactly this one. So this is standard in the study of PDEs. We are going to use this function here involving like solutions to equations that we know of as a test function. And using that, it helps us get the estimates that we need, okay? So, so yeah, that is very important. That is like very standard. Uh, you use the solution as a test function in order to obtain estimates. So uh, uh, setting phi to be equal to V, what do we get? So I'm just going to copy from my notes. We have something like, BR of X0 of A of X0 grad V dot grad V is equal to integral over BR of X0 at V minus CUV plus A of X0 minus A of X grad U dot um, grad uh, let's see, let's see. Grad U dot grad V, yes. Uh -huh. I was sort of confused, but yes, it's grad U dot grad V. So what happened was, remember these before were uh, phi, so we set phi to be V, so we have the following equation. So this is what we're going to work with. And so yeah, uh -huh. so uh, the start of part, uh, the part two now would be how do we obtain estimates from this equation. Uh -huh. And we're sort of going to try and justify these estimates in a natural way. Like, um, why is it natural to do these kinds of things? Okay, so part one ends here, we go to part two.